Hello. All right, getting things set up here still, getting my camera positioned. How is everyone today? It's always kind of tricky getting everything lined up over here with the lighting. All right, I think that's looking pretty good. How is everyone? Sorry, I'm a little bit late getting started on this. Originally, I thought I could get going at 1 o'clock, 1.30. <laughs> and then I went out for a skate with my daughter. And we kind of had more fun. And we're out a bit longer than I thought we would be. So by the time I looked at my clock, I went, oh, shoot. It's, it's already 1.09. <laughs> And I'm not home yet, and we also want to go out and get some boba tea. That's our, our thing after we go skating. We, we go grab some boba tea out here in Oakland, which tastes really good after skating. And then I got home and had to hurriedly grab everything and get all set up. But here we are now. So whenever I do these live sessions, I, I usually try to post sometime earlier that day to let everyone know the timing of the session. And I have a little question box there where you can type in your questions if you, if you don't think you'll be here during the actual live session or if you just want to make sure that I see it because sometimes when I'm actually painting here and doing stuff, I forget to look up at my screen and so I don't see what someone's asking at the moment but if you want to make sure that I see it then type something in over there and I will write it down and get to it during the course of this. So speaking of which let's see the first question that I had today is from Sophie T. Gizond and all she says is colors. <laughs> I don't know if that's a color, if that if that's a question or an exclamation of excitement about colors. I'm gonna assume that that's that's asking how I decide colors, and it varies. Sometimes with paintings, I really have no idea what my color scheme is going to be, and I just I just go with the flow. I, I pick a color that I like. Frequently, it's purple or green. <laughs> As you can see in this painting here, I have both of those colors. And and then I just I just start painting with it and I see where it leads me with my overall color scheme because once I lay down one or two colors, it it sort of in a way dictates what's going to happen with the rest of the painting. And it it's the thing that that kind of sets a boundary initially. And then I work with that. Green is often a, a go-to to start with something like that. In this piece in particular, so this is one of the five interior drawings, uh, interior paintings that I'm doing for a special edition of Tad Williams' Tail Chaser song. And if you are, well, if you're not familiar with the book, it, it's about cats. Cats are the main characters of this book. The heroes and the villains and everything. Cat legends and cat stories figure in it. And it follows the journey of one young feline. And it, it has a cycle to the story because it begins at the, at the, at the start with this young cat. It's springtime. He lives... He lives where he lives and and then he sits off on this journey and over the course of the journey the seasons are very apparent and it, it sort of goes with the narrative and I noticed that as I was taking notes on on illustration or on possible illustrations 
to do for this because it was fairly open to me about where I could insert the illustrations and what scenes I would choose to go with. And so I, I noticed very much this very seasonal aspect to it. And, you know, early on in the book, as he's beginning his journey, it, the spring turns to summer. And so that in particular is where this scene takes place. And so I have five illustrations. I decided that four of them, I'm going to try to follow a seasonal arc with this, especially since they're spaced out throughout the book fairly evenly, the, the illustrations, I mean. So that, that really gives me a chance to do that. And then I have a fifth one that's sort of a wild card. And for that one, I actually chose to illustrate one of the songs, one of the little mythic songs that the cats sing to each other and tell each other tales of for this cat hero. And so that one's a little bit outside of the seasonal arc that the other four pieces participate in. But because this one is now supposed to be a summertime scene, I really wanted to have summery colors in it, which for me are a very vibrant green, a lot of growing things. There's gonna be flowers, there's things that are growing in this wood. So this is the oldest wood is the name of this place where this scene happens. And it's, um, so I want, I want very real bright green, lively colors with a golden tone to it that sort of hints at that, that summery warmth that's going to leach into autumn, which of course is more reds and russet tones. And let's see some of these questions that are happening as I am painting. How many years have I been painting? Dragon Princess asks. I have made art all my life. <laughs> so from as early as I can remember, I have always wanted to be an artist. If you asked me as a child, my earliest memory of someone inquiring, what do you want to be when you grow up? as an artist. And so I always loved painting and drawing and doing anything with pencils and pens and brushes in all my spare time. But for serious application of watercolor as a medium, I began using that in 2001. No, wait, 1998, I can say, actually. <laughs> uh, and I'll get back to that story in a second about why I can pinpoint so exactly when I started doing watercolors. But art by Joanna Adams says, interesting brush. What kind? This is a handmade brush by Tracy Lebenzon. Uh, I will put links to any of my materials that you see me using during the course of this session here today at the end when I archive this. But Tracy makes hand makes brushes. They're amazing. I love I love many of them. One of my favorites is is this guy. This is his squirrel. Uh, sorry, goat hair and synthetic um, mix brush, which makes this beautiful, flowy, very um, very delicate line work that you could do with it. And this is a synthetic one. These are both one inch. The one inch uh, bristles and this one is the medium goat hair and synthetic but they are very fun and also they're just beautiful look at look at this handle i love working with tools that make me happy to look at <laughs> i mean it you know you could just paint with an ugly brush and i have plenty of ugly brushes too yeah you know, i have this one with just this plastic handle synthetic thing which has its uses too, but for some reason, you know, when I'm handling a brush that feels good in my hands and that and that looks nice too, it just makes me happy. So I, I splurge every once in a while on nicer, beautiful tools. <laughs> and, you know, things that are handmade are also really nice. So made by artists in and of themselves, of their own crafts. So yes, Tracy is an artist of making brushes. How do I start a painting, Indigo Dane says. I start a painting usually with 
some thumbnail sketches. Let me see if I can find one of my sketchbooks at the moment. I don't know how I somehow have managed to misplace. Oh, there it is. Okay. Here's a, one of my sketchbooks. And here are some thumbnail drawings. These are, and this is some concept art for another project that I'm working on. But I start with, I start with thumbnails like this, which are just quick little scribbles. Whenever I have any idea comes to me, I will stop what I'm doing and I'll grab for my sketchbook and just scribble something like this down. And it takes minutes, you know, five, five minutes tops, usually more like 30 seconds to get something down. It doesn't even have to really look like what you want it to be. Let me look at some of my older sketchbooks which have more. Yeah, so these are also thumbnails. All they have to do is convey the idea to you yourself as the artist. No one else has to be able to decipher them. And if you think that you are not going to be able to, <laughs> able to decipher it later on, then you can also write notes. So here's, here's a bunch of other... So the... Oh, the summer painting that I just reposted in Instagram feed today. So here's, here's Summer. This was a thumbnail that she originated from. And from there, I sort of played around a little, a little bit with the shape of the owl because I want the owl to be in a silhouette at the top. And then I, I went and did a more developed sketch of the figure because initially all I had was that, I had this pose and attitude and that just gives me a starting point. And then I, I start to develop the actual figure and how I want her to look in more detail. And after that, then I transfer it onto watercolor paper and I begin painting. But, you know, some of these sketches are very, very rough like that. And I take notes here to remind myself what I was thinking at the time. So this one was a, a possible sketch for spring and all of these had sort of shape changer legends tied in with the, the seasonal elements. And so this one was spring and, and I thought Ursa Major, which is a constellation that you see in the springtime in the in our hemisphere, in the northern hemisphere. And there's the Huntress Callisto and the bear and the bear silhouette in back with constellation stars in it. So that's those are the notes that I took for myself in case I couldn't figure out what that meant afterwards when I looked at the sketch. <laughs> anyway, if you like looking at some of my sketchbooks and, and listen to me talk more in depth about it, I think if a few um, a few months ago on my Patreon, I actually did do that. I do that. I try to do that every six months or so. I, I do a flip through of my sketchbooks and I talk about how the ideas develop and how they go from those very sketchy phases into the final versions of the paintings. So if you, if you like that, you can check that out on my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Stephanie Law. Again, I will put links to that at the end. Or you can always find that in my bio here on Instagram as well. What's this green that I'm using? I think it's sap green for the most part. <laughs> sap green is always a favorite across all brands. <laughs> Although in particular, this is Daniel Smith sap green. I also was using in some of the other places. Let's see. Uh, these are Roman Sesmol colors. And I was using some cobalt teal mixed in with sap green and also Aquarius green. That's a favorite of mine. I love how Aquarius green separates out into sort of golden tones as well as these bluish little bits of granulation. That one, oh yeah, that one, and Mineral Violet is the, where is it, Mineral Violet, this one over here. That is my other absolute favorite of Roman Sesmol colors, and that's what I've got going it in this upper branch area that I have not yet gotten to developing in this painting, but that's what I laid in as a base wash just to get things rolling. Let's see, do I draw an idea? Oh, how do, how do I draw an idea or do I just pick up and go from there is what Mi, Ch uh, Mi Chang King Zero is asking. 
I, well, I frequently have projects that I'm working on specifically. So like in this case, this is, these are illustrations that I've been commissioned for, to do for a publisher. And so I have specific uh, manuscript that I'm working with. I have the story, I have the book, and these are illustrations that are meant to go with that book. And there are other times when I really do just pick up and go. <laughs> if you go back through some of my archived IGTV videos, I, I've done several actually where I just take a blank sheet of paper and I start going with whatever comes to mind. And frequently it's it's because I've got some new colors I want to try out. <laughs> and so it's a good way to play around. It's a good way to let loose and not be held back by your expectations. You just start painting and, and see what the colors say to you, what the colors want to want you to do with them. You know, one time there was some, there's this bright yellow, beautiful, sunny, happy color that Lindsay of Artistic Isle sent me in this little packet of paints to try out and there were some bunch of other sparkly blues in there as well and I thought oh that's gonna be so fun to just do this bright happy sunflower and use some of these sparkly blue mica pigments into the sky and surrounding shadow areas and and so it just developed from there on the fly and I, I have that video in my archive if you if you go back and check that out if you wanted to see but yeah there are times when when I just want to play and it's it's refreshing and it gets you away from over planning and overthinking things to just take colors and pigments that are beautiful and just put them to the page and see what happens. And especially when you get to play with granulating things, that's when some exciting stuff can happen on the cuff and on the fly and, and you just go with it. You just let the let the pigments do their thing. And then you follow along in the wake of that. Let's see what what uh what an unusual looking brush you're using, Lena Fuber says. And yeah, I mentioned this a little bit earlier if you weren't if you weren't uh online yet at that point, but this is this is one of Tracy Lebenzon's brushes which are one of my favorites, and I will link it again later when this is archived, so you can you can come back and check that out if you wish. What kind of gold paint do I use, PB Langer asks, or is it foil? It is both. It depends on the piece. Some pieces are of, I, I definitely use sometimes imitation gold leaf, sometimes 24 karat gold leaf, and other times I use shimmery mica pigments. Now the the imitation gold leaf and the 24 karat gold leaf, I use those not because of pricing or you know practice or anything like that. I use them because they behave very differently. So the imitation gold leaf is typically some cap copper alloy and it is thicker. It is the sheets of it are thick enough that I could pick up a piece and not worry about it falling apart in my hands. Whereas the 24 karat gold leaf really just turns to dust when you touch it. <laughs> it's very delicate. And that means that it is really good for doing fine detail, tiny, uh, you know, if you, if you want to have detailed bits of gold that are following line work or in small areas or following the contours of something, then you need to use the 24 karat gold leaf because that will, that is, that is absolutely necessary. The imitation just will not do that. It won't behave correctly. You'll just get flaky big chunks of it and it'll be frustrating. But on the other hand, what I like about the imitation gold leaf is that it repels liquid when I've placed it on my page. And because I'm combining it with my watercolors, it, create some really interesting resist effects when I paint it as a base layer and then paint on top of that with watercolor ground 
and it that the watercolor ground will pull away from the surface of the copper because it is it's metal <laughs> and you're putting liquid onto it but it will also sort of cling to parts of it as well because the watercolor ground is thick enough it's thick and gooey enough so i do that as a base section in my paintings to build upon and then paint on top of and that creates a lot of really fun textures that I enjoy playing with and you know part of what I enjoy in my work is to really have a lot of textural uh, variation sometimes it's via the granulation of the watercolor and the pooling of liquid and, and sometimes it is via gold leaf and the physical texture that I add with using watercolor ground buildup so that I get some physical relief rising off of my page. Oh yeah, I have another one I can show you as an example of that. I just finished this one recently. So you can have a little sneak peek of it here. But this guy, this is for a show that's gonna be at Haven Gallery in the next few months sometimes. But this, so this over here is using 24 karat gold leaf, and I had to use that because I need it to really conform to the shape and form. This over here now is the copper leaf, which is un as an underlayer beneath the paint. This is on top of the paint, and I actually have some gesso to create the raised texture. You, know, you can't, it's hard to show, I'm sorry, I'm trying to shift it around so you can see that it's actually raised off the page. Versus this over here, which is actually underneath all the paint. It is my base layer that I put on before anything else. Oh, and actually I do have a full, well, it's a time-lapse video of the making of this painting. It's going to be next month's Patreon release. So if you're interested in seeing how this one happened, you can sign up for that. The, I think the videos are 250 a month subscription on my Patreon. So if you're interested in that, Waltz Fairy Art House says no Stellar J today. No, not today. <laughs> Which is unusual. They're usually around. I've also been getting a Mockingbird these past couple years. Mockingbird is really annoying. <laughs> he sets up right outside the window. And his, his favorite thing is to get going in the very early hours of the morning. And he's very loud. He's very exuberant, showing off all the songs that he knows. <laughs> so I looked up a little bit about mockingbirds because we have this one that keeps pestering us or serenading us. <laughs> and it turns out that they are kind of territorial and they kind of, they take they, they take a spot and then that's their spot. And it's going to be, that's probably going to be the only mockingbird you're going to hear in that range that area but they as they get older and they can they can be setting up singing in a spot for 15 years or something every springtime and when they as they get older they they gain more songs their collection of calls that they've learned to emulate grows their repertoire grows and so that's that's what they're doing when they're sitting out there annoying me <laughs> is they're showing off to any potential lady mockingbirds how old and wise they are to have gathered all these different bird calls and sometimes alarm sounds and car alarms and phone ringings and everything else. They're showing off saying, hey, look. I've got all these songs that I've collected up and it's because of my great age that I've been able to do so. so <laughs> and they'll actually go through variations too. They'll like they'll copy a, they'll copy a little hummingbird chitter, the angry squirrel thing that I described last time. <laughs> they'll they'll do that little chitter and then they'll do the, a little variation of that and another variation of that and another variation of that. I think I think they go for repetitions of three, but each one will have a slight variation of a theme. So yeah, that's, that's the other, that's the other visitor that we get these days. 
Do I do calligraphy? Artistic Empire is asking. No, I do not. Although I do like fancy pens. I do enjoy those. They are fun. Do you do calligraphy? Hmm. Let's see. Illustrator Nazrin says, tell me the name of one of your favorite illustrators. Well, like yesterday I was I was talking with my brother about J.C. Leyendecker, who is one of my all-time favorites. And we were we were going back looking through some of my some of my books and things because he was asking about drawing cloth. So my brother is uh, his it's Dave Law on Instagram. He's a comic book artist. We do quite different artwork. But we love to hang out and, and just do our art thing together frequently. And he was he was inquiring about some tips for drawing cloth. Because I love doing drapey cloth. Something so satisfying about that. And so I pulled out some books and we were browsing through them yesterday to to look at these excellent examples of that. Primary, of course, which is Musha. Alphonse Misha, uh, all that Art Nouveau, beautiful drapiness. What I, what always wows me about those is how he would do these really bulky dresses. They would be these bulky things that basically are wrapped sheets around these women, <laughs> and yet they look so elegant. And you could you could tell, even though they're these super bulky wrapped pieces of stiff cloth. You can tell by looking at it exactly how the figure is arrayed beneath that. And that is that is just so masterfully done. And something which I, I used to and, and still do just look at and awe and, and try to determine you know, how he did that kind of stuff. And, and Lion Decker also is amazing at that. Another gorgeous illustrator, especially of men. You know, you see all these you see all these artists all the time painting beautiful women, and I mean, I wouldn't say painting beautiful women is easy, but it's <laughs> I think it's easier than painting beautiful men that appeal to the public as as a uh, aesthetic piece of artwork for some reason, you know. But Landecker was a master of that. Art Andy Studio says, I love many cats in the painting. Yeah, that's the most, that's one of the most fun parts about doing this project. I just get to do lots and lots of cats. <laughs> I don't have cats myself. And so I've been, I've been asking my Discord Patreon people for plenty of cat anatomy feedback on them because it's it's one of those things where you know if you have a cat and you look at them all the time you're going to spot little things that I might miss and so I uh I've been doing that but it's it's been really fun doing all these cats <laughs> I don't have to worry about any humans at all in these paintings because it's a story about cats and cats are the heroes, and the cats are the ones that are journeying, and cats are the the antagonists and protagonists of this tale. It's a fun book. If you haven't read it, you can pull that up. It's an older fantasy classic, really. Tale Chaser Song. Yuki Nayandal says, first time watching you live. I'm a calligraphy artist in Jap Jap Japan. That's really cool. What inspires me? Vero Can't Draw asks. Um, nature, a lot of natural elements... You'll note that I don't often paint buildings or things with straight lines <laughs> because I, I just love the chaotic and 
organic movement and flow of nature and natural elements as well as let's see the well the things that I always a few things that I always list as as my inspiring elements so there's there is nature and growth and decay you know the the chaotic movement of things as they grow and as they are moving in the wind and in the world and then there's dance which is also about movement and flow and i think that this is why composition is something that i've always felt is one of my strong points because i think of i think of things in terms of how they move i don't really think of them as static they sort of get frozen into place and into time once i paint them but when they are in my head they are things that are active and moving and I, I almost feel it with my body as I work and as I paint and part of that I discovered in recent years another reason for why I feel this way is because I discovered that my way of thinking the way my brain works is not necessarily how everyone's brain works you know <laughs> you, you always think that your perception of the world is is something that is just how everyone sees and views things and thinks of things, you know, how your brain processes and, and deals with information. And when I learned about Mind's Eye a few years ago and came to the realization that I actually don't have one or a very, very weak Mind's Eye, you know, if you tell me, picture this, I always thought that that was a, uh, a figure of speech. I thought that Picturing something in your head was not a real thing. It was just a, a phrase that people used to describe, you know, in a metaphorical way and not realizing that people actually do picture things in their heads. I don't picture things. I feel them. I feel the movement of them. I feel the motion of it. And it, it lives in this very active way in my head until I put it onto a page. And so that that's the other question people ask me when they when I tell them now that I don't have a mind's eye. They say, how do you paint? How do you make art? And I think that this is this is just the way that I see the world and how I process that information and how I translate it onto the page. So whereas some people with very strong mind's eyes will see the image that they want to create and then basically transfer that from their head to the paper. For me, it's more, I have an emotion or a physical body feeling that I want to, I want to capture. I want to lay it down in a way that I can see <laughs> because I don't see it until it's out here on the paper. And so it happens in this very shifting way. And that's why as I sketch things, even it, it develops as my pencil moves across the page, because with every line that I place onto the paper, it is further defining and creating the, the delineated boundaries of the thing that I'm creating, the thing that I'm drawing. And so as I paint, it comes into being. So it was it was a very interesting for me interesting thing for me to find out about mind's eye and to learn about how my way of processing things might not be how every single person does and it's helped me to better explain my process and better explain how I work with composition and conveying those ideas to other artists and other people. Let's see, one of the other questions I got, Forever Wolf 13 asks, feeling lost as an artist, how do I find direction? Um, I think that there are many ways. If you are feeling lost and you're not 
finding the thing that that makes you want to create art then you have to sort of let loose of your expectations and don't be so don't don't have such make make demands of yourself and of your art and just sort of play with things as i was talking about earlier sometimes it can be as easy as taking out your brushes and looking for the color that sings to you the color that makes you think of sunflowers in the case for me when i was talking about earlier or this spring green that reminds me of aged gnarled trees my oak trees that surround me here in Oakland, these live oaks, uh, which always seem draped in this color, you know, and then just start playing with it. Make shapes with your brush. Make blobs of color that spread and play with wet and wet. That's, that's what watercolor is so much fun for. You know, you can't do that with oil paint or with digital, but you can just take a color and lay down a wash on your page with watercolor and just drop another color into there and let it spread and play and see what elements of that sing to you and what makes you want to do something with it. Even if it stays abstract, it doesn't even have to turn into a final thing. Maybe it's just colors at play that you are enjoying working with. But, but the, the key is to play. And, and to not say, I need to make a masterpiece. I need to make something that's amazing. I need to level up with this painting. You don't need to level up all the time. You need to remember what makes you want to paint. You need to remember what is the reason that art brings joy to you. And if you can remember that, then ideas will start to flow back and they will start to come. If you need to get extra inspiration, you know, go out and look at the world around you. Look at for me, like I said, nature is a great inspiration for me because I love the forms and flow of movement of nature. I love how my live oak tree limbs twist and curve and twine in among themselves and the branches and the, and the vines and things. And look for something that calls out to you in your surroundings. Maybe for you, it isn't nature. Maybe for you, you do like straight edges and lines in buildings. You know, urban sketching is an awesome um, thing as well. And a movement of artists that, that enjoy just going out into the city and, and painting what they see around themselves, including the people in the buildings and the cars and everything. I enjoy doing that when I'm on trips, when I'm on vacation. And I take along my, my travel sketchbook and I do a lot of gouache paintings then of those kinds of subjects. And those are fun for me as well. But taking the pressure off of making art that has to be for something, that will, will let loose a lot of the anxiety, I think, of creating and finding what to do. Uh, breathing in moments is asking, what is this brush that I'm using? It is a Tracy Livenzon handmade brush. Here, let me put the link in because the question keeps getting asked here. <laughs> uh, on paint brushes, I believe. There it is. All right, I'm going to drop the link here in the comments. And, uh, oh yeah, I should also mention if you ever do, if you do order anything from Tracy, if you mention Stephanie as the code, you can get 10% off. Oh yeah, what's my link for? Where is my cat, Yuki asks. I don't have a cat. Unfortunately, my husband is very allergic to small furry creatures, <laughs> specifically to cats. <laughs> We do have many, many stray cats that wander around outside. Not stray cats, I should say. My neighbor's cats, because pretty much every one of my neighbors around here has about two outdoor cats. So one in particular is named Ace, and he's super friendly. He's got these the cutest white paws, and he's always wanting to get pet. 
He's like a dog cat. That's what we call him because he loves everybody. So he's always wandering around. He always tries to get into my house as well. <laughs> I think he's given up, but in earlier days, he used to, every time we opened the door to enter, he would always try to squeeze in and we have to say, no, Ace, sorry, you can't come in because my husband's really, really allergic to you. As cute and as endearing as you are, you will make him sneeze. <laughs> Illustration, uh, illustrator Nazrin says sometimes falling water color on the white paper and then start painting with less fear. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was talking about is just, just dropping watercolor on your page and, and then just appreciating how beautiful watercolors move and flow and, and just letting go of demands of what it has to be and instead just letting it tell you what it is going to be. Fresh Deb 52 says, the handmade watercolor brushes are fabulous. They are pricey, but the best for line work and they hold lots of pigment. Yeah, they do. Especially, I was saying before, the this goat hair synthetic one is my absolute favorite. I can, I can just paint forever on one dip of it into my into my pigment because it just keeps going it holds a lot it's really neat the way he's structured this with the the goat hair is shorter with the synthetic bristles as the tip for a nice point but the goat hair just really holds a lot of pigment also the other benefit of the goat hair synthetic is no goats are harmed in the making of those brushes <laughs> they are fuzzy and they shed <laughs> So if that is a concern of yours, uh, they are ethically made. <laughs> Let's see, where am I with this piece right now? I'm gonna zoom out to get a larger picture feel of it. So you see, I've been working on this tree during the course of all this babbling. I've been using some of this Holbein uh, Antique Bamboo is the name of this color over here. This kind of tealish, greenish color. And it's just really pretty layered on top of the sap green for some, this, this kind of subtle, and layered on top of the sap green and on top of the purple that was my base wash layer. And it creates just this beautiful subtle layering of color across those. It's a semi-transparent color. I think it's got some whitish uh, gouache feel to it a little bit. What color will the main, pat, main cat be? Holtzberry Art House is asking. The main cat is the main character of this story. It is Tail Chaser, and so he is going to be orange. He's an orange tabby-ish cat, I believe. I've painted him in some of the other pieces already. Let me pull out the other one. There he is over there, and he's also very small up on that bridge over there. So he's going to be an orange color. Here's the rest of this painting. This is the autumn scene of the piece. This is much further along in the journey. So summer has given way to autumn and I wanted to have a more golden russet tones for it. Lilium is asking, what about silver paint? What do you use? Well, there is silver leaf. Silver leaf behaves as copper leaf does. So it is one of those that is thicker and it is not going to be able to be capable of the very fine, detail-y line work that a 24 karat gold leaf would be capable of. So it's just something to keep in mind when using it. It's, it's better for blocky shapes and for larger uh, areas. 
So there's there's silver leaf, and there is also silver silver shimmery pigments. And so I have quite a few. Let's see, where are my shimmery things? Ah, here we go. So silvery mica pigments are usually pretty easy to find. These in particular are artistic aisles. This whole this whole tray is artistic aisle. Isn't that so pretty? <laughs> just looking at this makes me happy. It's just such sparkly colors. <laughs> That's what these are. Uh, so I have these sunbeams that are coming down across the page. And when I deal with that, what I do is I just paint, lay, I build up the layers more in the areas outside of the sunbeam. And so that leaves the sunbeam itself as a lighter segment, lighter unpainted, not, not completely unpainted, but showing more of the whiteness of the paper coming through. Got a little bit of that bamboo over there in the beam, which I don't want. So yeah, so all I do when I work on that is I paint more layers on the areas around the sunbeam. Palladium leaf is a better option, Dutch Nature Art is saying. I have not tried that. I will look for that. Where where do you acquire it? I, have, I don't think I've ever seen it before. And the paper that I'm using, Illustrator Nazrin, uh, asks, this is Moulin de Roy Canson, 300 pound. I believe that's 600 GSM if you go by that scale instead. Uh, what am I doing? Let's see, I want some more yellowy tones. So this tree in, over here is more, is more in the background, so I don't want it to be as green as this, this foreground tree. And so I'm, I'm going to be using some more, a little bit warmer, warmer light green tones, white light green yellow tones for that. Oh yeah, someone early on, I think there was a question about how long I'd been doing watercolor and I was answering that. Let's see, where's this sunbeam coming from? I realized that I made a mistake in my early wash because this sunbeam is actually supposed to come through that little crack and so I need to extend this wash going up through this tree to that spot. Then this is just the initial wash layer and then after this I start painting in the detail of the trees and the surrounding areas, but this sort of just gives me my boundary to work with. Dutch Nature Art says silver leaf oxidizes too fast. I buy it in a small gilding store in Netherlands. Ah, okay, well I'll have to, have to be on the lookout for that. Norris is the brand name. Cool. Thank you for that suggestion. I will definitely take a look and see if I can find it. All right, I think that coming down to the end of what I can do for this session here today, I've got a get going for some other stuff. Also, you know, we are <laughs> still in work from home. And so there are other meetings happening through my walls, which are sort of distracting me at the moment. <laughs> so it's 
hard to concentrate on what I'm saying when I'm hearing all this other stuff going on. I'm sure everyone else has also been experiencing this the past year and a half. But I'm going to zoom out here so you can see what I have created during the course of this almost hour. Here's what we've been working on, mostly on the tree over here, all these upper branches and things. And there's my palette and stuff. And I want to say thank you, everyone, for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed listening to me go on about all these random subjects. <laughs> and I will let you know when I have another live session. And thank you. All right. Goodbye.